title of the sermon this morning is A Formula for Peace. A Formula for Peace. And if you would, uh, keep something there in Colossians 3. We'll come right back. But if, uh, just go ahead and turn over Philippians 4. We're going to be in Philippians 4. I know I preached a sermon a few weeks back out of Philippians 4, but it's just a, a great passage there, and I think there's a lot we can get out of it. So go to over Philippians 4. We'll be coming back to Colossians 3. Now, I think everyone in the room this morning would probably say that they desire that the God of peace would be with them. And if we go through the Bible, we'll see that term used a lot, the God of peace or the peace of God. So God is a God of peace. God is somebody who can give us peace. And I don't think there's anyone in the room that would say, you know, peace is not something I'm interested in. That they want a life of uh, strife and turmoil, turmoil and anxiety and all these things. Everyone in the world, anyone with the right mind is going to say they want peace. And what we need to understand this morning is that true peace comes from God. You know, that, that we are given peace from God, not as the world gives, but as He gives it to us. That's the source of true, true peace, is that it comes from God. But I also want us to notice that God doesn't just dole out peace, you know, at, with no prerequisites. That there actually, there is a formula, or there is a prere some prerequisites. There are some things that we have to do on our part in order to receive peace from God. Now, <clears throat> if you look there in Philippians 4, you'll see, it says, Be careful for nothing... But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Look at verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So he's saying these are the things that will happen. Now look at verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. So keep something there in Philippians chapter 4. Because we'll be coming back there and go over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. We're going to start seeing that every time the peace of God or the God of peace is mentioned, it usually follows a list of things that we are supposed to be doing. Look at Colossians chapter 3 verse 12. It says, Put on therefore the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any... Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which you are also called in one body, and be thankful. So we see that there's a lot of things that we have to do in order to have that peace of God to rule in our hearts. It says that we are to put on, therefore. We are to forbear. We are to forgive. And again, we are to put on charity. You think about that act of putting something on. You know, no one decides to get up in the morning and take their shower and get dressed and say, I'm going to put my clothes on and just kind of stands there and waits for the clothes to jump on, right? It takes effort. You know, you have to pick out the clothes you're going to wear and put them on. So what I'm trying to get across this morning is that, yeah, if we want the peace of God to rule in our hearts, we have to put on. We have to be willing to forbear and forgive. There's things that we have to do. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll see the same thing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 14, 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, the Bible reads, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that you none render evil for evil unto any, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. Verse 16, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God, in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That God of peace, the peace of God, comes at the end again of this list of things that we are doing. Warning, comforting, supporting, being patient, following that which is good, rejoicing, praying, not quenching the spirit, despising not prophesying, proving all things, holding fast that which is good, abstaining from all appearance of evil. So there's a lot of things that we need to do in the Christian life in order to receive the peace of God. Now, if you're there in Philippians 4, if you would just turn back to Philippians 4. Keep something there all morning. We'll be in Philippians 4. What was the, the prerequisites? What were the things that were required for us to receive the peace of God or the God of peace that we saw in Philippians 4? It says in verse 9, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. 
There are things that we need to learn and to receive and to hear and to see and that at the end of all that, then do. That we might have the God of peace to be with us. So that's the formula there. Learn and receive. Hear and see. And then last of all, do. I just kind of want to look at some of these things and, and, see, and make application here as we go. Now the first part of that formula is learn and receive. We are to learn and to receive. You know, we need to learn from the examples that we see around us in our lives. We need to learn from other Christians. We need to learn from our pastors, from spiritual leaders. We need to even learn from our parents, for all the children in the room. There is a great deal of things that kids need to learn from their parents. We need to learn from our friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, we should never get so proud and haughty to think that we can't even learn something from the unsaved, perhaps. I mean, think about out in your, out in your jobs and, and where you work. You know, I, I've had several different jobs over the years, and if it was a new trade or a new skill that I was coming into, you know, there was a time where I had to learn from somebody else, saved or unsaved. So we need to learn from other people. We need to be willing to do that, to learn from supervisors and co-workers, from our parents, from other Christians, from pastors, and from folks that are just, you know, good examples that are around us. But not only that, another great place to learn, or something to learn from, is to learn from bad examples. You know, I did this a lot early on in my Christian life, you know, after I, shortly after I got saved, I started to take a hard look at the crowd I was running with, a hard look at the people that I would call my friends at that time, and I started to notice they had a lot of problems. I started to notice they had a lot of things going on in their life that I didn't want anything to go on with me. I said, man, I don't want to have to deal with what they're dealing with. I learned from that. I learned from some bad examples, too. <clears throat> you know, I think that's a great reason why we should take our kids soul winning when opportunity allows. They can learn from some bad examples out soul winning, can't they? I mean, we take them out on these res trips, and they get to see the beer cans piled up by the door. They get to see people living in, in places you'd say, there's nobody living in there. No, there's a whole family living in there. People living in, you know, in, in, in poverty and squalor. People that are suffering you know, from sin. We see that even here, just going around these neighborhoods. Taking our kids with us to show them, look, if you, you know, we're, we're living this way. We're living after, to, after God. We're trying to do the things that God has commanded us to do. These people are not. And our kids, with our own eyes, without us having to even say anything, can see the difference. And they learn. They learn from bad examples just as well as they do good examples. Now, in order to learn, it's going to require, you know, some discernment. It's going to require some judgment on our part. You know, we'll have to be honest about ourselves. What areas are we lacking in? What is it that we need to learn? What is it where we need to grow? <clears throat> I know that for me, one place that was a bad example that I was able to learn from, you know, I say don't say this with any disrespect, is but for my own home, my own upbringing. Less than ideal, and I'll leave it at that. But I learned, hey, that's not what I want for my family. That's not the kind of dad I want to be. That's not the kind of parent I want to be. I'm not saying there was never anything good that, that came of that, that uh, my parents didn't take care for me and love me and, and, and do the best they could, but they were unsaved. They were lost people. So that's another example that we can learn from. If we're going to learn from bad examples, we're going to have to have some discernment. Now, it says there the first part of that formula is that we need to learn. That's the first part. And we should never be willing to learn from others. I mean, wh wh who else are you going to learn from? Learning is something that always you always have to receive from an outside source. It's not something that's innate within us. If you're learning something, it's because you're lacking somewhere. Which leads us to the second part of that formula. It says learn and receive. We should receive instruction. We have to receive learning. Now here's the thing. If you would keep a go ahead and turn over, keep in Philippians, but turn over to Proverbs chapter one. And when you get to Proverbs chapter one, go ahead and put something in Proverbs chapter one. Keep something in Philippians four, and then for the rest of the sermon, for the entire sermon, just keep something in Philippians or Proverbs chapter one as well. So Philippians four and Proverbs one, because we're going to spend some time in Proverbs coming in and out of it. <laughs> You see, learning and knowing something is not enough. It's not enough just to learn something. It's not enough to just say, I have this knowledge of something, I know what this is, and, and that's, not, that's not enough. 
Knowledge, learning, is something that has to be assimilated. It's something that has to be incorporated into your life. It's something that has to be absorbed into who you are. It has to be part of who you are. You can think of it like this. If you were to, re if you were to learn how to read music, right? If you were able to sit down, pick up the, 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 the piano book or the hymnal, and tell us the key signatures and what... You know uh, what the times was and what scales are. You know you could you could you could play all you could uh, read all the notes in a scale. You could read music, but you never sat down and learned how to play. You never actually used it to play an instrument. I mean, what good is that knowledge if it's not something that you're going to use? If it's not something you're going to make a part of what you do? <clears throat> and this is a point that's emphasized in Scripture. If you're there in Proverbs chapter one, look at verse one. The Bible says in Proverbs one. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, <coughs> the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtly to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Notice there, it's not enough to just know, to learn. It says there, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. That's the first part of that formula. You know, we can know something, we can perceive something, we can discern something, we can recognize it, we can become aware of it, we can be conscious of it, we can grasp it, we can understand it, we can identify it, we can comprehend it, it can be something that we figure out, we deduce, we conclude, we can see it and know it and still not benefit from it. <coughs> Another good illustration would be the fact that <coughs> anyone who drives a car knows that a red light means stop. And if you don't know that, it's been nice knowing you. But we all know that, right? I mean, you think some people, the way they drive, they, they don't know that. But everyone knows that. You're taught that. Red means stop. If the right's red, it's too late. You know, you, you, we all know yellow means hurry up. It's about to turn red. No, kids, that's not right. It means slow down and get ready to stop. You'll see how it really works in the real world. But red light means stop, right? We know that. We understand that. We grasp it. We get it. We have that knowledge. But it won't do us any good if we don't put our foot on the brake. If we don't receive it, if we don't say, okay, I know this, now I'm going to receive it. I'm going to make it part of who I am. It's going to be something that is part of my nature. When I see that red light, I hit the brake. We also must receive. It's not enough to just know something. You have to receive it. That's why it says in verse 3, to receive the instruction. Not to just know it, but to, not just to perceive it, but to receive the instruction. That's what's going to benefit us. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 9, verse 20. Or excuse me, Proverbs 19. Proverbs 19. You see, if we take the time to not only learn something, if not only to perceive it, but also to receive it and make it a part of who we are and say, I'm not just going to understand this, but I'm actually going to put it into practice in my life. I'm going to receive the knowledge and instruction that I've, has been given to me. We are going to be the ones that benefit. It's going to benefit us. It says there in Proverbs chapter 19, look at verse 20. Hear counsel. It's good to hear it. It's good to know it. It's good to learn. It goes on and says, and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. You want to be wise? You want to grow up and have some knowledge? Well, it's not enough to just learn something. You have to receive that instruction as well. And, you know, conversely, refusing instruction will harm us. It's, if, we, if we reject it, if we refuse it, Proverbs chapter 1, Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 24, it says, Because I have called and you have refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. Verse 25, But he have said at not all my counsel and with none of my reproof. I also will laugh, laugh <clears throat> when your fear cometh. I will laugh at your mock calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. Verse 27, When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For they hated knowledge. They did not choose the fear of the Lord. But they would, not, they would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore they will eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. That sounds like peace. But it took somebody who had to learn it and receive it. They had to learn the instruction. They had to receive 
the instruction. If we're going to receive, if we're going to learn, then we're going to have to be taught. We're going to have to go to where instruction is being given. <clears throat> if you've still got something in Philippians 4, again, keep something in Proverbs, but turn back to Philippians 4. <clears throat> we understand that we not only need to learn, but that we also need to receive. And then when we do that, we are the ones that benefit from it. And if we refuse to do it, we're the ones that are going to be harmed. We say, okay, I, I want the God of peace to be with me. I want to learn, I want to receive, then you need to go where instruction is being given. You need to find a source of knowledge. It says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen. He said those things that you hear and the things that you see. Of who? He said, in me. The things that you have heard and seen in me. That's what Paul's saying. We'll say, hey, Philippians, the things that you've heard and seen in me, those are the things that he wants you to do. Those are the things. He is the source that you should have learned from and received from. They heard and saw Paul. Where at? It wasn't at the nightclub. It wasn't at the comedy store. It wasn't out on the lake. It wasn't on the golf course. Where did they hear and see Paul? In church. They saw him in church. That's where they heard and learned and received. That's where they saw him in church. They saw him in the synagogue. They saw him when he was preaching to the lost in the synagogue. They saw him when he was preaching to the lost house to house. They even saw him in jail. There were things that they could see Paul go through. They learned and heard and saw in him when he was in jail. I mean, this is in Philippians, right? Wasn't there, a, wasn't there a guy that was from Philippians that, that Paul saw in jail? A Philippian jailer? I wonder if he's a part of this church. So I remember, I know Paul. I've seen Paul. I've heard Paul. I've learned a few things from Paul. I remember when I met Paul. He was in jail. And not because he was, you know, running red lights. Because he was preaching the Word of God. In order to learn and receive, we must see and hear. And you must see and hear from an instructor. The student comes to the teacher and not vice versa. <clears throat> I'll read to you from Proverbs chapter... Actually, you know what? Turn over to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. You have to go to the source if you're going to learn. It says in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 5, Proverbs 20, verse 5, Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water. There's a man out there, he's got counsel, it's in, it's, but it's, like, it's in his heart. And the Bible says it's like deep water. You ever try to get something that's down deep? You ever go to the deep end of the pool, the diving pools, and they, you, know, you throw the little sticks down there and stuff, and you got to... You know, the older I've gotten and the more buoyant I've become, the more difficult that is. <laughs> you know? I remember as a kid, I could just, boom, real easy, get down in the deep end. You think about guys that want to go down and find some deep, some treasure that's deep in the bottom of the ocean, the things that they have to go through. These guys that go out, you know, the, the bottoms of the Atlantic and work on these, these lines that lay, lay on the floor. I mean, they have to go and they have to go in these compression chambers for weeks on end. It's very dangerous. They basically live under these high pressures at all times just so they can go do this work. It's not easy to get to some of these things that we are considered valuable. The Bible says here that counsel in the heart of man is like deep water. It's not always easy to get out of him. It's not always easy. He's not just, you know, some vending machine. He can pop a few nickels in and, and, and get, get some wisdom out of him. Because he knows not to speak in the ears of a fool. Because not everyone wants to, not everyone's going to uh, learn what he has to say. It says counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding, somebody who's learned, Somebody who's ready to receive will draw it out. They will draw it out. That takes effort. See, no one gets water out of a well without lowering a bucket, right? If you think of the old, the old, the old wells that had the bucket on the rope and you had to lower it down, or even the ones that we have maybe today where you have to put the, the arm on it and you got to sit there and pump that thing and, and prime it and get that to come out. It takes effort. You got to lower the bucket. 
You have to go to the source of knowledge if you're going to learn. You have to go to the source of knowledge if you're going to receive. No one gets a diploma, no one gets a degree without taking some classes. Or passing some tests. <clears throat> if you want to receive knowledge, then you must go to the source of it. And we're talking about receiving things from Paul, but what about, where did Paul learn it all from? From Christ. From his words. That's, where, that's the greatest source knowledge of any of us have right here. All the wisdom and instruction and counsel that we need is right here in this book. Amen. But don't expect to get anything out of the Bible. Don't expect to get to that knowledge by if you don't read it. You know, you don't just hold it on your head and hopefully it just seeps in there. This isn't how you get the knowledge out of the Word of God. Just use it as a pillow at night and maybe it'll just kind of work its way in, right? Or try to wad it up and shove it in your ear. It doesn't work like that. you got to open it up and drag your eyes across the page and think about what it's saying. And the more we do that, the more you'll want to do it. Bible reading will become a delight. And sometimes, you know, we just got to read it out of character and out of habit and make ourselves do it. And often when we do that, we'll say, man, I just don't feel like reading. You get a few minutes into it, you'll say, man, I'm sure glad I'm reading this. And there's dry spells in the Bible, no doubt. There's some things that are harder to read. But... Uh, you know, it's something that we need to do. And I've preached other sermons about Bible reading. I'm not going to go off on that. But there are things, I mean, this is the source of wisdom. This is the source of, of instruction and learning. These are the things that we need to learn if we want the God of peace to be with us. This is part of that formula. <clears throat> if we neglect it, then we're not going to receive the instruction that we need. There are things that you will miss out on if you neglect the preaching of God's Word. I mean, let me say this very clearly. There's nothing you can't learn just reading on your own. There's nothing that I'm going to preach or some other man's going to preach across the pulpit that you can't learn on your own. But it, might, it just will take a lot longer. I mean, there's so many things that I learned just from preaching that, yeah, I could have figured it out eventually. But boy, having somebody else have already done the study, somebody else who's already read the Bible a multitude of times, somebody else who's already received the instruction, feeling willing to you know, impart that knowledge... That accelerates our learning. That accelerates our ability to receive the knowledge that's in the Word of God. Somebody else, you know, has already lowered the bucket down on the well, and they've got a bucket full, and you just need to hold your cup out. Let them put a little in. Put a little in. Here, there, here a little, there a little. <clears throat> you see, Paul wanted these people to learn and receive and hear for one purpose. You know, he wanted the God, we want the God of peace with them to be with us. And God, the God of peace will be with us, but there's some prerequisites. And Paul said, yeah, I want you to learn those things which you have learned, those things which you have received, those things which you have seen, those things which you have heard. What did he say at the end? Do. There was something that he expected them to do. It's not enough to just know and receive and have all this knowledge. Go ahead and turn over to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. The purpose of receiving, the purpose of learning, the purpose of getting in your Bible and, and seeing and hearing, the purpose of coming to church, for the preaching of the Word of God, for, see, for seeing and hearing the Word of God, is so that you would do. So that you would do something with it. You're going over Philippians 3. I'll read from 1 Corinthians 4. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons I warn you. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. And he wants people to see him, to hear him, so they would learn to do. He said, be followers of me, even also as I also am of Christ. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and preaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of Christ, of God in Christ Jesus. It says in verse 15, Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if anything be, other, be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. 
Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. See, Paul, in these passages that we read, he's often imploring other people to follow his lead, to follow his example as he follows Christ. He's not breaking the mold. You know, he's, he's following in the footsteps that have already gone on before him. He's following Christ, and he's asking these people to follow him. <clears throat> through seeing and hearing. He's setting an example. Notice there in Philippians it said in verse 15, let us. He's including himself in that. He says it again there in, a, in, in a verse 16, nevertheless we're until we have already attained. Let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. <clears throat> he wants people to follow his example. He's including himself. You see, our children, this is a good lesson for parents, is that our children should not only learn and receive our instruction. I mean, we should take the time to teach our kids, and they should have the they should take the time to learn and to receive. They should pay attention when they're being instructed. And parents should be teaching and, and, and instructing their children. I mean, I think my wife was talking about it, I believe, just last night about you know how we're teaching our kids, and it's just I mean, you think about it, you have to teach your kids everything. I mean, there, there's very few things that they don't need to learn. You know, how to read a, she, she's telling them how to read a measuring tape, how to read a ruler. We take that for granted as adults. We forget there was somebody who took the time to go, this is an inch. This is a quarter of an inch. Well, what's a quarter? And then you got to you know, start explaining you know, portions. And, and I mean, you could just see how it just turns into this bigger subject. Because kids... If they have a desire to learn and receive, they're going to start asking more questions. <clears throat> so it's important that we teach them. But they should also see and hear us. Not just, not just what we tell them, but they should see and hear us do. Not just what we say, not just what we tell them, not enough to just see, not enough to see what we do. They should see what we do, not just hear what we say. If you're in Proverbs chapter 1, you still there? You got something there? Proverbs chapter 1. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5, A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. <clears throat> if we do... I like what it says here, that he shall attain unto wise counsels. <clears throat> we think when I read this verse, you know, sometimes we think that that means that he will, he will be around other people who are wise. But that's not what it means. To attain means to achieve. That he himself will become a wise counsel. That's what it's saying. A wise man will hear and increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. If we do... If we do all these things, if we take the time to learn, if we take the time to receive, if we take the time to see and hear from the source of instruction, if we take the time to do these things, then in time we ourselves will become wise counsel. And we will be seen and heard of others who will also learn and receive. This is process of learning it's, and teaching. It's perpetual. It just keeps repeating itself. It just, it's a perpetual system. If you want to turn over to second again, keep something in Proverbs, but turn over to Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two. We'll see this where there's just this perpetual system of learning. There's just this concept where we see, hear, and do, we become wise. Then others begin to see, hear, and do what we do, they become wise. And isn't that what we want for our kids? I mean, if that's not enough reason. For us to get in church and to hear the word, the preaching of the word of God and to teach the word of God in our homes. That they would, they would learn to be wise and to have and, and, and to, to be able to attain unto wise counsel themselves, to not grow up and be fools. It says there in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, 
The same commit thou to faithful men. Why? Who shall be able to teach others also. You see that process there? It was the things that Paul, that Timothy heard from Paul, the things that he learned, that he was to commit to faithful men, that he was going to teach others also. Timothy heard Paul, he saw Paul, he attained unto wise counsel, and now he's committing it to faithful men. So that those faithful men can go and teach others also. <clears throat> the process of learning and teaching is perpetual. It says there in the end of uh, where we were, you don't have to turn there in Philippians chapter 4, you know what it says by now. Those things which you have seen and heard, do. It says do. Now do is a verb, right? It's an action. It's synonymous with perform. Do it. Here in Proverbs chapter 2, Proverbs chapter 2. Look at Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1. We'll see how the do is carried out. It says, my son, if thou wilt receive my words, you know, I'm glad you're learning. I'm glad you're receiving it. I'm glad you're seeing and hearing. I'm glad you're receiving these things. If you will receive my words and hide my commandments with me, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thy heart to understanding. And if thou criest after knowledge, if thou and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. If we're going to learn, and we're going to receive, and we're going to do, it means we're going to have to apply. It's going to require effort. I mean, doesn't this sound like a lot of effort here? I mean, you think about these old, you know, like back in the, you know, the gold rush, when men were just traveling, to dragging their families across countries to go find gold in California and I mean, they didn't have the technology that they had today, and they're, they're just, you know, pickaxes and dynamite and wheelbarrows and buckets, I mean, hauling rock out, digging tunnels into, into the earth, just trying to find gold. The effort that goes into that. Even today, these, these mines that just go down miles into the earth, and just the millions of dollars that are spent to try and find precious metals. That's a lot of effort. <clears throat> but that's what God's saying here, that we need to cry after knowledge and lift up thy voice for if we need to seek her as silver and search us for as hid treasures. You know, if we're not even cracking the Bible open once a day, can we really say we're seeking after knowledge and understanding like a hid treasure? That we're really wanting to know and receive instruction if we don't even have enough effort to just read a proverb, read for 15 minutes? Amen. If we can't get out to church at least once a week, are we really seeking after those things? And I understand that people get sick and, and, and sometimes we can't be, be here for, for health reasons and other reasons, but that should be the only reason. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> if we're going to learn and receive, it means we have to apply. It's going to require effort. You have to do. And it will not always be easy to do these things. I'll remind us of what it said there in, in 2 Timothy 2, where he said, you know, the things which thou hast heard of me, commit thou to a faithful man who shall be able to teach others also. And then it goes on in verse 3 and says this, therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. It's not always going to be easy, the things that you learn and hear and see, and if you're going to do and carry it out, it's going to require effort, and it's not always going to be easy. The question is, how bad do you really want it? Do you want it as bad as that... You know, that, that, that claim, claim jumper in 49, the guy was out there with the pickaxe and, you know, metal pans that squatting down the river trying to find gold somewhere. Do you want it bad as least as he wants his gold? Are we going to cry after it? Are we going to lift up our voice? Are we going to seek it as hid treasures? I mean, we know one thing, and if you would turn over Philippians chapter, chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1. I mean, God's got the treasure. God's got the gold. God's got the silver. God's got the knowledge and the wisdom, the counsel and the understanding. He's ready to give it to whoever wants it, who's ever willing to put the effort to receive, to learn, to see, to hear, and to do. God's got it. He's going to keep up his end of the bargain. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. I thank my God upon every remem remembrance of you, Always in every prayer of mine with all and with all 
Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing, I mean, Paul had no doubt about this. He was confident about it. That he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it. I mean, the, God, the, the, the work that God's begun in you, he's going to carry it out until the day of Jesus Christ, until the day of redemption. God's not going to fall short on, on his end of the bargain. The question is, are we going to hold up ours? God wants us to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. God wants us to become the perfect man. And one day, you know, God will, will make us new in him completely, not just in the spirit. Amen. And we will have the mind of Christ, the Bible says. But let me tell you something. You already have the mind of Christ when you have this in your name. And sure enough, whether we take the time to go after the mind of Christ now or not, one day God will, you know, bring us. He'll He'll pull up, you know, He'll He'll uh, He'll draw out the slack. He'll make up the difference where we came up short. But why wait? Why should we wait? Why not just go ahead and get after it now? Why don't we just do now and get the mind of Christ now as much as we can? I mean, what do you? I mean, people want to rule and reign in, in Christ's kingdom, but what do you think you're going to be teaching? If you're ruling and reigning over all these cities, like the Bible says, if you're going to be ruling and reigning with Christ, He's not writing a new book. It's going to be this one. This is what we're going to. This is going to be instruction manual for the millennium. You might as well learn it now. You might as well receive the knowledge and instruction now. And that's going to require effort. We're going to have to do. <clears throat> And if we do all these things, as it says there, and the God of peace shall be with you. And as I started out saying this morning, everybody wants the peace. Everyone wants God's peace. But we saw the prerequisites that we have to learn, that we have to receive, that we have to do the things that God has instructed us to do in order to receive it. <clears throat> you know, Paul says an example by the things we have heard and seen in him. We can look to Paul and we can see the example that we see in Scripture. But it's up to us to learn and to receive these things that we might do them. And when we do them, then we have the God of peace with us. Go ahead and turn over to John chapter 13 and we'll close there. John chapter 13. See, we have to learn. We're the ones that have to receive. We're the ones that have to do. But we have a great promise that Paul gave us that if we will learn that if we will receive, that if we will do these things, the God of peace would be with us. And that's a great promise. The Bible says in John 13, look at verse 15, For I have given you an example that, as, that ye should do as I have done to you. This is Christ speaking. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, right? If you know these things, you're happy. No. Nope. It says if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. It's one thing to know. It's one thing to know the Bible. It's one thing to know what's in here. It's another thing to do it. <clears throat> if we want peace, if we want the happiness, then we must do what we have learned and received and heard and seen. Let's pray.